I mean, I know quite a few of you in here because you take my yoga class and or my enhanced fitness class. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I've been working here at the Senior Center as a subcontractor for 10 years now, teaching fitness classes. And occasionally I come in and I do a little session on a particular topic. Um, I've done meditation before, and um, I actually did a six-week course here on meditation. So I'm friends with the Senior Center, and they're friends with me, and so they've allowed me to come in to do this, and I appreciate that. One thing I want to do is applaud you all for being here. Give yourselves a hand. And the reason I say that is because you're obviously concerned enough about your well-being and your health to be here. So thank you. Thank you for coming. So the title today, as you can see, is Living Your Most Vibrant Life and Simple Ways to Get There. And so, you know, living a life that is active and vibrant and happy doesn't really necessarily have to be that difficult. <coughs> are we having videotaping issues? Yes, we are. Okay. Oh. <laughs> this thing does not want to stay. Okay. Are we good now? Yeah, okay, so. great. Um, but before you get started, there is one important thing. That little man there. Always, always, always contact your primary care physician before you engage in anything new, whether it be an exercise program or making any kind of dietary changes, okay? It's very important that you have a good place to start and that your primary care physician is apprised of everything that you're doing. So, let's see. So I'm gonna, a lot of people have asked me the differences between allopathic and naturopathic medicine. And I bring it up now, just allopathic simply means, that's your primary care physician. Okay, this is a medical doctor. They diagnose, they treat symptoms, they treat illness, they prescribe pharmaceuticals, okay? A naturopathic doctor looks to facilitate balance in the body systems. They use a variety of CAM modalities. Does everyone know what CAM stands for? Mm -hmm. Complementary Alternative Medicine, okay? They treat the whole person. A naturopathic doctor looks at the whole person and not just a symptom that you may present with. And a naturopathic doctor remains in harmony with nature. Okay. So those are the two differences. And the thing of it is, is that both are needed. Okay? Both are needed. And you know, should you choose to go in that direction? Um, there is a place, if I have a cancer diagnosis, I want this allopathic doctor on my side. I want an oncologist who has studied this and knows what's going on, okay? But I also want some of that natural support that these guys may not know about. So both are important. As for me, I'm studying to be a holistic health practitioner, okay? So this is my goal to help stimulate the power within, within each of you, by offering suggestions on a variety of holistic modalities that can assist in bringing the body systems back to balance and functioning at optimal level. I do not treat, I do not diagnose, I do not heal, I do not cure, okay? My goal is not to empower you with knowledge, to educate, so that you can make informed decisions about your own health. And that's really important, taking that power back, knowing your own body. Those of you that have taken yoga with me will often hear me say, I don't live in your body. You live in your body. I don't know what it feels like to be in your body. Only you know what it feels like to be in your body. So use that and take that power because that's very important. You know, even for when you do go to a, an allopathic physician, Knowing your body and know what, knowing what's going on is important information to have. So that's, that's what I do, and that's what I aspire to do using the education that I'm currently getting at the American College of Healthcare Sciences. Again, I do not treat, diagnose, heal, or cure. Very important, I simply educate. So how can we obtain and keep a good quality of life? 
but this is what we're going to address today. Exercise. Very, very important. Movement is paramount. You need to move. I've been teaching fitness classes since 1986. Okay? I'm 58 years old. I've been doing it a long time. Um, and I have seen the various different trends that have come forth. And, and the science sometimes, you know, doesn't always catch up with what we're doing. And, yes, ma'am? What if everything hurts? I you used to what? walk a lot and I used to, and then I had a lot of issues with arthritis. And just everything, I, I can't even walk anymore hardly. It's just everything hurts. Right. So the question is, what if everything hurts? Well, there is always something to do. You can start with seated exercises. With what? Seated exercises. Oh, seated. Staying in the chair. Simple movement through the joints. You Moving the hands, moving the fingers. Just sitting there and curling your arms. Engaging the bicep muscles. Sitting and lifting the legs up and down. Engaging the quadricep muscles. Okay? This brings lubrication to the joints and it helps you to engage in that movement. And then before you know it, you'll be able to stand and do it. And we have someone in here who used to sit for part of my classes. Guys, yeah, you're smiling back there. Now she does the complete class with no problem. So you will see the results. You will see the benefits. But you have to start somewhere, but start where you're at. You, know, you don't need to go run a marathon, all right? Just start where you're at with something that's simple. That's a great question. So the next thing we're gonna address is nutrition. Ah, that's a passion of mine, nutrition. It can be so confusing, right? I mean, we hear about these various different diets. We have, let, let's see what's hot now, the keto diet, the Atkins diet, the South Beach diet, you know. Uh, don't eat carbs, yes eat carbs. Don't eat fats, yes eat fats. Eat high protein, don't eat protein. Eat meat, don't eat meat. It gets very confusing, doesn't it? So hopefully I'll help to clarify something for you here today and it'll make sense, or at least begin to make sense. So the next thing that we're gonna address in the path to wellness and living a vibrant life is stress reduction. Stress wreaks havoc on the body and all of its systems. I can't tell you enough how, how much stress will manifest itself, not only emotionally, but physically. You will physically start to feel bad. The body systems will react to stressors in your life. Very important to get stress under control. And finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about sleep. How many of you get a great night's sleep every single night? I'm not sure I do. A lot of what you're saying, because I have fibromyalgia, and they told me, and I also have an adoptive, they told me I wouldn't be any more. She's right on all those things. It all makes a difference. Yes. Thank you. It's a great testament. Yes. So fibro, you know, someone with fibromyalgia, I mean, yes, following every exercise, day. nutrition, stress yeah, reduction, it makes a difference in your sleep. Excellent. Very important, you know, sleep is a time when our body heals. So it's really important to get good quality sleep. So let's get moving. Love my little hearts. So some activities for exercise. Walking, hiking, gardening, joining a class, swimming, light lifting, bicycle, yoga, dancing. Find something that you enjoy, and that's the key. Because if you don't like doing it, guess what? You're not going to do it, right? I hate to run. Always hated to run. Everyone kept telling me, oh, you'll get these endorphins. You know, you'll get that runner's high. Well, I ran searching for that runner's high. <laughs> I ran, and I ran, and I ran. And all I got was tired and angry because I hated running. I hated running. And, but what I enjoy is dancing. I enjoy fitness classes because I like that community, which is really important. That's, what, that's very important in overall health building. In, in, in yoga, we call it a sangha, which is basically just building community. Well, you find that in various different classes. And I'm gonna tell you, that's just as important 
is building that for your own well-being. But the thing is, is find something that you enjoy doing and just do it. So the impact that movement has can give you that feeling of accomplishment, right? Those of you that haven't done anything before and that all of a sudden started coming to classes, like I said, I know some of you in here, doesn't it feel good that you now can do something that you previously just didn't think you could? It impacts you physiologically. It impacts your body. It impacts you psychologically. When you're exercising, those endorphins are releasing. You know that runner's high I just talked about, right? Well, if that happens for some of us when we're in a, an aerobics class or taking a, a spin class or doing Zumba, whatever it may be, whatever speaks to you, those endorphins, we feel pretty good. We feel happy. So some of the physiological, physiological at the big word, isn't it, results to expect over time. You increase your muscle strength and flexibility, okay? You increase your range of motion. So say for instance, my arm can only go here. After doing yoga, I might be able to lift it up a little higher. All right, you increase that range of motion. Your bones become stronger as well as your ligaments and tendons. Right, we are at a senior center here. Osteoporosis is something that you know we need to be aware of because they all of us here past the menopause state, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is really interesting because I was diagnosed with osteoporosis at age 42. And yeah, you could have knocked me over with a feather, right? Because I exercised, I ate right, I did what I thought were all the right things. So osteoporosis is one of those silent things that you don't necessarily have symptoms for until it happens, until you happen to get that DEXA scan. Everyone in here, I assume, has had a DEXA scan. Yes, good. You always need that baseline. So, it's very important. That it improves your posture, improves your balance. As we begin to get older, the risk of fall is greater. It's just a fact. And exercising helps that. Strengthens the heart, lowers the blood pressure. Improves oxygen delivery. What do I mean by that? It means all of your cells are getting the oxygen it needs. We'll talk a little bit more about breath work when we get to our relaxation part. But just being able to nourish the body with oxygen, our cells need it to survive. I mean, we can go a couple days without food, we can go without water, but we can't go without oxygen for even, you know, two minutes three minutes, depending on the person. It's very important. Uh, improved cholesterol, better digestion and elimination. Elimination's a hot topic, ladies. I'm telling you, you gotta eliminate. It's just a fact. Improved immunity. So these are just some of the things, the, some of the physical ways in which exercise helps. And gradually, as we talked about earlier, you'll be able to increase that activity level. What about psychological changes? Exercise has been shown to reduce tension and anxiety. It improves your self-esteem, relieves moderate depression, improves coping skills, improves sleep, improves cognitive function. Why do you think the cognitive function improves? Blood flow. Blood flow. Oxygen. So, very important. And then, you know, sometimes we've given up activities that we used to enjoy because we can't physically do them anymore. Well, over time, with exercise, perhaps you can once again participate in those activities that you thought were long gone, right? So the moral is just keep moving. Find something you like to do, do it, keep moving. Even if it's getting up every morning and just taking a walk, it's, it's just, you have to move. Now we're going to talk about nutrition. You are what you eat. Who's heard that before? Right? 
I love the visual. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> right? <laughs> you are what you eat. From a holistic perspective, we are what we eat, what we think, and what we do not eliminate. Our thoughts have power, right? But we don't eliminate, guess where it's staying, ladies? Building up in your body, toxins, all right? Elimination is very important. So, who can tell me some of the ways we eliminate? Other than the obvious, sweat. Sweat. Guess what? Exercise can make you sweat, right? Our skin's the biggest organ of elimination and absorption, by the way. So you need to watch what you put on your skin. Uh, so, what other ways of elimination? Breathing. Our lungs. Our lungs help us to eliminate. Exactly. We breathe in fresh air, we exhale carbon dioxide. So, and then of course our elimination system, shall we say, our urinary tract, your genital system helps us to eliminate. So elimination is very important. And, you know, I'm going to get a little gross here for a minute. Do you look at your poop? Yeah. You got to. And I know that sounds a little bit gross, but it can be a big indicator of what's going on in your body. All right? So they actually, believe it or not, and I didn't put it up here, have a poop chart. So you can Google the poop chart. All right? And you can look at what your poop looks like. And you're laughing, and it, it is kind of funny to talk about. It's one of those taboo things, but it is important when you go to your doctors to let them know how often you're going and what it looks like, okay? Because it can be an indicator of something serious. It may not, but it could. So it's very important to know these things. So look up a poop chart, ladies. Do you know what the purpose of stool softeners is? Because I was, when I had hip surgery, they recommended I take that, and I'm still taking it, but do I, do I need to take it? And well, I don't really know why I was taking it. When well, I a stool softener is surgery. just that. It makes your stool soft so they're easier to pass. Whether or not you actually need to take it or not is a question for your doctor. Okay. But it, that's what it does. It just makes the stool softer so you can pass it easier. So, but there's a reason they gave that to you and find yeah. out what that reason is and whether you still need it or not. What's that? Probably. Yeah, it was for, it was right after, because I never had yeah. any problem before, and right I didn't after know why, but I had a whole bottle, so yeah. I, I just kept using it, but I don't know. Yeah, and sometimes, <laughs> you know, when you've had surgical procedures, certain medications make it harder oh, to pass okay. your stools. Yeah. So, keeping with nutrition, we can eat an excessive amount of calories and still be malnourished. There can be a person that is 200, 300 pounds and still be malnourished. And why is that? They're eating the wrong things. They're eating the wrong things. Again, go back looking at our little uh, you are what you eat picture, right? If you're eating the wrong things, you're just getting calories and being mal malnourished. And on the opposite end of the scale, you can lose weight eating the wrong things. I can eat three packs of Twinkies a day and lose weight because I'm not eating enough calories. But I'm also not getting any nutrition. And when I'm not getting nutrition, your body is gonna get the nutrition somehow. Your cells, your organ systems will get what it needs, but what it's going to do is steal from other organ systems and bodies. And that's when illness starts to happen. Because your body is going to maintain homeostasis. It has to, right? It just has to in order for you to live. But it's going to start stealing from other things. 
So I'm going to give you a good example of that. You know, back when you, I, I saw all of your eyes kind of gasp when I said that I was diagnosed with osteoporosis at age 42. My blood work was always fine. Calcium was fine. Vitamin D was fine. All right? So why do you say osteoporosis, your calcium levels were fine, your vitamin D was fine? Well, my blood was stealing the calcium from my bones. So my blood work was not a good indicator mm. of whether or not I was at risk for osteoporosis. All right, so you see what I'm saying? Your body is gonna maintain homeostasis, but it's gonna steal because it has to in order to maintain, in order for you to survive. Very important to know that. So when you put something in your mouth, nutritionally, you want it, you, you just want to look at that food and say, is this serving my body? Is this giving my body what it needs? Or is it just giving my body empty calories? Did you, um, I take, I had a bone density test like 15 or five years ago. Mm -hmm. and. I was shocked like you were because I drink milk, I love yogurt, I love dairy, I love calcium, and right. you know, unfortunately I love cheese, but you know, that, you know, that gains weight. But I was told that, um, you know, I needed still, because I had significant amounts of bone loss already five years ago, so I was, I've been taking like calcium and it's 1,500, I think it's a way big number, and mm -hmm. vitamin D, D3, I think, is 600 or something. But will that prevent loss, or like you said, it was stealing from the calcium pill, is, is, would that prevent loss, or it just won't get any worse? Or Well, um, it, again, I don't know what you're taking, and I don't know the plan that your doctor has right. for you. If, he, if they recommended supplementation, yeah. then they're obviously keeping a close eye on it. Right. Um, there are drugs on the market that prevent further bone loss. There are pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, one is a folia um, that actually not only prevents loss, but helps to build bone back up. And that's a shot that is taken every six months. And then there's something called Reclast, which is a once a year infusion. And then you have some of the other drugs that are used for osteoporosis, like Boniva, and uh, there's a couple Fosamax. other. Fosamax. Uh, Forteo was one. That's an injection that you give yourself. Right. So the, the thing of it is, is that you need to work with your doctor or endocrinologist or whoever you're working with to find out what the best course is. That of action. A is it, what's an endocrinologist doctor? That's the an endocrinologist works with an endocrine system. Okay. Thyroid, parathyroid. So uh, that's the calcium and the Bone that's who I work with for that, oh. but you can work with your regular doctor as well. Because they said I had in my shoulder osteopenia, which is the beginning. Beginning, yes. Of, uh, it's not. So taking steps now is loss. really important no. to prevent further bone loss. Um, eating a proper diet is part of that, and I'm going to show you some ways that you can, some additional ways that are surprising that you can get calcium into your body through nutrition. So, right now we have, according to Murray and Fazorno, which is a book that I'm going to share with you, uh, they say it's a virtual landslide of data has continually emphasized the Western diet as a key factor in virtually every chronic disease, especially obesity and diabetes. So the standard American diet, the acronym, SAD, and it is SAD. It's unfortunate that our Western diet is like it is. He's so sad. <laughs> so I'm going to go over the nutrients that our body needs and some ways to get those nutrients. Okay? So we have what's called macronutrients. They provide fuel for the body and serve as building blocks for the cells. And that's what you've all heard about, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. We need them all. Okay. So I'm not a big fan of diets that will eliminate some of these or take them out of proportions that we need um, because we need them all and, and they're essential. Our cells need a consistent supply of these nutrients for fuel, 
we need the calories to be able to move, to be able to function. Building materials, build our muscles, build bones, and for regeneration, for cell replacement and turnover. So we need all of these. Then we have micronutrients, okay? Our micronutrients are chemical elements or substances that are needed in trace amounts to ensure normal growth and development. And that's your vitamins, your minerals, your trace minerals, your phyto elements, and your essential amino acids, okay? Phyto um, you're gonna get most oh, can be sorry. found in fresh fruits, vegetables, and herbs. Okay. So here's an example of some good quality proteins. We have lean meats like chicken breast, fish, eggs. Yes, eggs are fine. Right? There's the big hype, well, it's going to raise my cholesterol, blah, blah, blah. Eggs are a great food, but here's the caveat, all right? Free range, organic. Very important. You know, when, remember when I said you are what you eat? Well, you are what your food source eats as well. Is okay? that on the carton, the free range? Yes, it is. Yeah. It is on the carton. And I would even go as far as say organic, okay? Because, like I said, you are what you eat. So if you are eating a chicken breast, for instance, that has been raised in close quarters in a hen house and fed nothing but corn feed and sometimes other chickens, that's what they're fed, that's what you're eating. If they're fed pesticides, if they're fed hormones, if they're fed antibiotics, that's exactly what's going into your body as well. So you are what you eat and you are what your food source eats. So that's the same as eggs are fabulously nutritious. The yolk and everything, wonderfully nutritious, all right? But free range, organic eggs is where you're gonna get the most nutrition. Things like lentils, quinoa, endamame, mm. plain Greek yogurt. Let me ask on plain yes. Greek yogurt. Okay, so you know now you have organic yogurts that are you know stony field and nature's promise and everything, but they're not necessarily Greek. Mm -hmm. Why the Greek? The Greek is just a richer source. Now I don't have any problems with stony field. I feed that to my grandson, uh, which is just regular. regular so as yogurt. long as the yogurt is having the um, the yeah. back. The bacteria, bacteria yeah. you know, the good the bacteria, bacteria, that's good what bacteria, you want to look probiotic. for. Probiotic. That's what you want to look for, correct? Yes. Okay. And you want it to plain. be, and I, the reason I say plain is because oh, yeah. yogurts are loaded with sugar. Loaded with sugar. And well, even if you put vanilla in it, it's packed with sugar. Yes. So you really have to be cautious, you know, and you know, I'll show you a couple, a couple of examples that I have here um, about the sugar content because sugar feeds bacteria, all right? And sugar is hidden in a lot of things, and you really need to watch that. Uh, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, great source of protein. Black beans, sardines, almonds, cottage cheese, broccoli, Ezekiel bread. Have you ever heard of Ezekiel bread? Yeah, you usually can find it um, in the organic section, frozen, typically, Ezekiel bread. Great source of protein. Great is source that gluten-free? They do, not all is gluten-free, but they do have some gluten-free. So they have different What, what taste is it? Is it wheat? Is it, is it depends on what kind you get, because like I said, they, they have it in different kinds. So they even have uh, English muffins. Yes, they have the English muffins as well. Do you so, at a particular store? Um, usually wherever you, they have a, like a natural section or a health food section, and I have found it where it's frozen. Yeah. They have it frozen. frozen. Okay. So carbohydrates. Carbohydrates does not mean french fries, okay? We have sweet potatoes, legumes, bananas, lentils, quinoa, oats, buckwheat, beets, apples, blueberries, oranges, carrots, beans. Great sources of carbs. You have a, a blend of both simple and complex carbs in here. We need both. We need both. 
So, what's a healthier way to get your carbs? Mm -hmm. We got that big juicy burger and fries here. It looks appetizing. Then look at all the vegetables and grains and everything. Again, ask yourself the question every time you eat, what is this giving my body nutritionally? Is it nutrient dense or is it just empty calories? Unfortunately, the standard American diet is right here. The fast foods, I know I'm 58, so I know you all remember when the fast foods kind of first broke on the market with McDonald's and things like that. And you go in and you get a hamburger and french fries, and the hamburger was this big, the french fries was in a little bag, and that was a normal serving. Now the hamburger this big, big bag of french fries that can serve a family of four, right? And then this super-sized soft drink that is huge. Huge. Uh, yeah. I'm going to ask over here mm -hmm. uh, on the right of the good. Uh, is this deceiving? I see bagels, which I would not have thought would be part of it. But is that like, you know, an American diet might be okay for breakfast, so I'm going to have coffee and I'm going to have a bagel mm -hmm. with cream cheese. Right. So the bagels are there and if you look, they look like they're probably a whole grain, and I think it's just representing the whole grain, that whole grain concept, but I agree with you. Um, a bagel is not something that I would have for breakfast, and the reason being is, is one, I want to have some protein when I eat, first off. And I understand, and maybe you can glean that, that it's very important at all three meals to have protein yes. and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Is that that true? is correct? Okay. That is correct, and it has to do with the way things are digested within our body. Okay. So, and it, she was saying that it's important to have a little bit of protein with each meal, and that is absolutely correct. So, what that does is helps to stabilize the blood sugar. All right. So, for instance, you brought up the bagel, so I'm going to use that. Mm -hmm. That is going to affect the blood sugar more significantly unless you have a little protein with it. Okay, so you want to make sure you have a little protein. I wouldn't do a whole bagel. If you want to do bagel, if you love bagels, that's fine. Get a whole grain bagel and do a little one, you know, cut it in half or whatever, and have a little bit of protein with that, you know. Put is a egg on top of it. Is it better to have five small meals or only if you're diabetic? Um, no, actually, it's that's a great way to eat because it gives you that consistent source of energy, five small meals a day versus having big meals. Because when you have those big meals, you'll, you get that feeling of being tired. You know, who gets really tired after the Thanksgiving meal? They just want to go to bed, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, your body is working really hard to digest. When you have the small meals,